Our next author this morning is Dr. Guido Holzman. Dr. Holzman is a professor of economics at the University of Angers in France, and he'll be talking to us this morning about his new book, The Ethics of Money Production. Guido? The Ethics of Money Production is a concise exposition of the principles of money and banking. Uh, from an Austrian point of view, uh, the book is organized in three parts. The uh, first part deals with uh, the natural production of money, uh, so in a free market setting. The second part deals with inflation, various forms of uh, infringements of property rights leading to inflation. And the third part is an application of uh, these, um, uh, this type of analysis that is being developed to an analysis of uh, the history of monetary systems in the past 300 years. So it's a very concise exposition. And uh, uh, down to the present day. Uh, the, the background of the book was um, that um, uh, I was being asked by the Action Institute about five years ago to or six years ago to uh, write a, a book on money and morals, or monetary policy and morals, and which I sent out to do. I was very glad to have this opportunity because I intended to write a book of this sort for some time. And uh, then it got a little bit out of hand. So it was very interesting, as, as Lou said, very interesting. And uh, you go on writing and on. And uh, eventually it was the double of the size uh, that was initially planned. So they wouldn't anymore publish me unless I, I cut down all the interesting things that I th thought <laughs> were in the book. So they just wanted me to to basically restate those things that were already in the literature uh, for their audience. And I was not happy with this, so we had to separate our past. And I eventually published it with, with a very decent publisher, which is the Mises Institute. I'm happy with, for this. And they put it online, so we can read the book online. And it's actually not even a dollar, right? it's zero. <laughs> it's a very handy, nice book, uh, very beautifully made. It's a layout by Kathy White. She does uh, most of the, the layouts here for the Mises Institute. It's particularly beautiful. So what you see here is uh, an excerpt from um, a German medieval law book. In those days, there were comics. Okay, <laughs> Law books were comics and uh, not actually commented. So what we have here is, uh, uh, so from the 13th century, from the Sachsen Spiegel, uh, uh, the scene where, where it says that render to Caesar upon uh, what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. So God is in the middle, Jesus, and we have uh, to the left hand the, uh, the citizen, or should we say subject, that is being lectured. And to the right hand there is uh, the emperor, and it's a very nice setting because nobody regards the, uh, the uh, looks at the emperor. Yeah, so the, uh, good, good old times. Yeah. So um, the book is dedicated to Hans uh, Zenholz because Zenholz was one of the well, the only major Austrian uh, writer, monetary economist, who tried to integrate uh, Austrian analysis with uh, a Christian uh, teaching, a Christian perspective. And that's exactly what the book is uh, doing as well, or trying to do as well. So I'm not only arguing the standard three Austrian lines on uh, our current monetary system, which are you do not need it because there is a private uh, alternative. You can run a monetary system on a completely uh, private basis that is on the, only on the principle of private property. Uh, and, and contracts that are implied. So there can be competitive production of money, can be a competitive production uh, of banking services and so on. We don't need a systemic risk authority and we don't need a central bank and these other things. Uh, second, um, uh, monetary uh, interventions do not provide any service. That is the only service more precisely that they do provide is to uh, create a redistribution of resources to the benefit of certain privileged groups and to the detriments of the rest of society. Uh, but apart from this, uh, there are no uh, positive, there's no value added, so to say, of monetary policy. And the third line would be that not only does monetary policy or monetary interventions do not create a, a value added, uh, do not promote the common good, but they rather create positive harm. Uh, this is, uh, and this comes in particular in two forms. One is uh, the redistribution, which is uh, 
brings about uh, disruptive effects uh, within society. And the second one is uh, the, are the intertemporal disequilibria that are analyzed in Austrian business cycle theory. So we have these uh, three standard lines. And then uh, a fourth uh, point that is a little less stressed in typical Austrian text, which is that uh, these interventions are immoral. Uh, they are immoral on two accounts. First of all, they are intrinsically immoral because they, uh, all of them uh, are based on or imply violations of property rights. And what I do in the second part of my book is to go into detail analyzing the various ways in which uh, governments violate property rights by setting up legal uh, rules under which money production takes place that involve the violation of property rights. Monopoly, for example, and uh, legal tender laws which override choices by market participants. And the second account on which it is immoral is indeed that it's contrary to the common good. Uh, so it creates positive harm. It does not promote uh, production and consumption within the economy, but diminishes those things. Um, so uh, utilitarian arguments play a central role, and therefore economic science has come uh, uh, to play the, the elevated role it has come to play uh, for, two or for more than 200 years and it therefore plays a very big uh, role uh, within the argument of the book. But it's not uh, all that there is to it, so it's, uh, it's more. Now, um, what are the objectives, the particular objectives that I set myself in writing uh, this book? Because now you might think, well, what's the point of, of buying this other book, Austrian book on monetary economics? Because Mises seems to have said pretty much the same thing, Rothbard as well, and uh, others as well, Roth Walter de Soto, Hayek even. And uh, I agree, of course, I didn't even attempt to reinvent the, the wheel. Okay, so there's no absolute new thing here, but there are, uh, there are a couple of new things um, in that I uh, try to stress in order precisely not to repeat what we find in the standard Austrian text. So one, uh, uh, four or five particular features. The first one is that I stress the tradition uh, of Austrian economics, a tradition that reaches way back beyond Karl Menger. Okay? Uh, Austrians, uh, the, the take that Austrians uh, have on uh, questions of monetary policy reaches back to the 14th century uh, and to a uh, very important intellectual of the time, Nicholas Oresmi, uh, was a bishop in Caen, or oh, excuse me, uh, a bishop in. Uh, uh, I forgot it. It'll come back. He was born in Caen, and uh, he was um, bishop in a, in a place close to this. He was the confessor of the king, okay, and he was the author of the first treatise entirely dedicated to an economic subject, namely the production of money, uh, which is also an inspiration for the, the title of the book. By the way, the title of the book is kind of funny. Uh, it was first uh, uh, planned to be uh, just money. It's a play on words. Just money is money that is just, as justice, but it's also just money. It's not something else. Right? <laughs> and then uh, Lou Rockwell, actually, who now, as, I'm, I've, as I've less, just learned, takes uh, lessons as far as title giving is con concerned from, from Judy Thomason, recommended that I better choose the ethics of money production. I've been very happy with this uh, title, which is, well, therefore, in, in this tradition, reaching back to Oresme. Uh, and Oresme strongly opposed any uh, government meddling with uh, money production. Typical money production of his time was coin making. Uh, and so Resmi said, well, once you have created a coin, well, you can just have it uh, run out if nobody any needs, needs it anymore. Well, you just uh, can let, let it drop and produce new coins. But once a coin is there, you shouldn't change it. You, know, so you should not uh, debase the coinage in particular. Uh, and he uh, rejected all utilitarian justifications of such meddling. Uh, and of course, there his, his uh, argument was not much developed, it was rather primitive, but uh, often just implied. Uh, but he clearly was of the opinion that no positive utilitarian contribution could be reached by government meddling with money. And this inspired a long row of thinkers who um, developed monetary thought in the same tradition. Uh, so we have people like Gabriel Beale in the 15th century, we have uh, uh, Ptolemy of Lucca, we have uh, uh, the late scholastics in Salamanca, Juan de Mariana, 
uh, Azbil Guelta. And then we have the whole line of uh, monetary thought that starts in the 18th century with uh, uh, Cantillon, Richard Cantillon, and goes through David Hume and uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, uh, and, uh, and finally reaches the Austrians. So the Austrians are just the hairs, and this is particularly clear in the present day, which virtually everybody else is a kind of a, a mercantilist or neo-mercantilist. And often they say that well, they are inspired by Keynes, right? The Keynesian economics, but truly Keynes just warmed up, brought back doctrines that were already known uh, and argued for in the 18th century. So the Austrians are long, uh, the, in a long tradition. Uh, and this tradition at its beginning emphasized the strong uh, connection between utilitarian considerations and moral considerations, was uh, dropped a little bit uh, in the middle and, and then brought up in the 20th century again very forcefully by Murray Rothbard. The second objecti objective was to uh, focus um, uh, on the role of legal rules under which money is being produced. So uh, the title, The Ethics of Money Production, is significant because for, uh, in, in Christian literature and in the literature of other religions as well, we find, of course, a uh, huge uh, volume of tracts written on the morals of money. But usually this concerns the way we should use money, that is, we should, how, should, how we should spend it, although under which circumstances we are allowed to keep it, according to the Keynesians, never. Uh, but there is virtually, there are very few things are actually being said about the ethics of money production, the way money should be produced. And this has, as I try to show, uh, very important consequences uh, on the functioning of the economy. And then, um, so what I do less in the book is to repeat myself, so you won't find much about fractional reserve banking, you won't find much about central banking, uh, you won't find much about um, uh, uh, the theory of money prices, right? so I don't repeat the subjective theory of value, I don't really uh, give just a very brief summary of the uh, uh, pricing, the monetary pricing, because all of this was done already in other texts. Um, on the other hand, I, so I, I stress so legal rules and I uh, stress uh, certain other subjects that have uh, not been dwelt on much by Mises in particular, for example, deflation. And so I take a rather positive view of deflation. I think it plays a very important social uh, function. I do not agree on this account with uh, Professor Zenolds and my distinguished uh, predecessor on this podium that deflation is like running over a dead person a second time. I rather think it's deflation is like taking out the driver out of this cab so that he will not run over the next person. And that's the function of deflation, to stay in this image or in this metaphor. So, the book is not a, a treatise on money, but it's much more than an introduction. Right? It's a kind of an intermediate text, let's say, between um, Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money, which is a wonderful and very, very important introductory text, and uh, on the other hand, Mises' uh, Theory of Money and Credit. A third point uh, that I try to do in this book is to clarify uh, important logical distinctions in monetary analysis. This concerns, for example, the distinction between the production of money and the production of certificates. Now, uh, as I discovered in, uh, in writing the, uh, the book, actually the, we have the category of certification, which is a very general uh, category. It includes both coin making and banking services. So what banks did originally in issuing uh, money certificates, subsidies, it was precisely this, issuing uh, certificates under the form of substitutes. Whereas what we did in former times in coin making was to create certificates that are physically integrated with the monetary object. Um, um, then uh, another uh, clarification uh, concerns the origins of fractional reserve banking. Uh, so I, I distinguish three origins of uh, fractional reserve banking can come as a perversion of uh, either credit banking or a perversion of uh, deposit banking, but it can also come as a preemptive uh, anticipation of future government interventions, because what governments often did was to just crack down on banks and say, well, uh, this is the famous story about the robber, right, and was being asked, so why did you rob a bank? And you say, well, because that's where the money is. And uh, it's a little bit the same thing with uh, governments. Uh, they 
in, in the past, they have often robbed banks, they have confiscated the deposits, because that's, what, that's where the money was. Okay? So what banks then did, often in anticipation of such an event, was to go ahead and, and loan out this money before, before it could be taken away. Uh, fourth point, and this is uh, uh, rather central and I, th I think really different as compared to uh, the, the standard Austrian text, is the stress on the pervasive role of moral hazard, uh, which results from monetary interventionism. Uh, this is probably the, the, the most significant shortcoming in Rothbard's uh, writing on uh, monetary economics, and I consider Rothbard to be the most important Austrian when it comes to monetary analysis. Uh, for example, also take his book, uh, Power and the Market. Uh, you can rewrite the entire book, uh, rewrite write another Austrian, a new Austrian theory of uh, uh, government interventionism by just taking your point of departure in the theory of moral hazard. There's a very, very important role in social security systems, of course, very other, various other government interventions, and in um, monetary policy in particular. Right? That's what we have seen on the markets uh, in our day, right? this pervasive moral hazard which has encouraged and, and therefore produced, so to say, um, business practices, business investment strategies that would not otherwise have existed, at least not to this extent. Uh, so the banks have run down their, their cash balances because you don't need any more cash balances. <laughs> if, you, if you have a Federal Reserve, right? so if you want to rob a, somebody these days, you don't go to a bank. That's where the least money is, right? You, you go, <laughs> go somewhere else, <coughs> a grocery shop or something. Um, and, uh, and they have also reduced their equity right? because the only point of holding equity is to protect yourself against uh, uh, oscillations of your uh, investments, of your assets. Now, if you have a Federal Reserve that stabilizes uh, financial titles on the stock markets and on the bond markets, well, you don't need much equity. So people are running down their equity. And as a consequence, the whole financial markets uh, become very, very fragile, vulnerable. The last point um, uh, was, well, to uh, bring the Austrian analysis of uh, monetary history up to date. So what we have here is up to date is uh, 2007, approximately. So it's, it's pre-crisis. Uh, which uh, so th th there's room for further elaboration, but what I do is to analyze the, the dynamics of our current fiat money uh, regime and explaining why there is a tendency toward a uh, unified fiat money uh, global system. I think the book is uh, is a wonderful um, or useful. Well, I shouldn't praise myself too much. It's a useful. Um, tool for people who wish to go beyond the beginner state, do not want to stay at an introductory uh, level, uh, and it's, it might be used in, in classroom with your, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. King, who is using the, the text at Benedictine College. I'm, I'm very happy about this, and uh, so I uh, can only encourage you to consider this at least as a possibility. If not, you can always hold this up. As, as a sign, uh, if you walk down the streets in, in protest lines and uh, before the entrance of the Federal Reserve, get, <laughs> run down to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Thank you.